Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar with Mr. Jim Tompkins, um, the founder and chairman of Tompkins International. So today he's here to talk with us about the path to peak 2021. So we saw a very interesting peak season in 2020, unprecedented. Um, it left many people scrambling, trying to find capacity, trying to get their technology in order. So this year we're going to start early. We're going to get his expertise on what to expect for 2021's peak season, what we can do to start, um, and where where we need to be looking. Um, so if you haven't heard of Mr. Tompkins, we could really spend the whole webinar telling you about him. But he actually, um, just to summarize some of his accomplishments, he owns Tompkins International. So he focuses on implementing end-to-end -end supply chains. He's worked as a consultant. He's spoken. At many events, I've heard him speak a couple times. He's um, read several of his articles. He's contributed to um, more than 30 books. He's been quoted several times. He's received more than 50 awards, including the Frank and Lillian Gilbreth Industrial Industrial Engineering Award. That's a mouthful. Um, he's the president of the IISE. Um, he's been named a distinguished engineering alum by Purdue University. He's really a wonderful thought leader in the space. If you haven't followed him on LinkedIn, I highly recommend it. I highly recommend reading some of his books and articles. Um, but without further ado, we'll get started with Mr. Tompkins or Mr. Jim talking about peak 2021. Uh, thank you for joining us, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here, Emily. And, uh, you know, when my wife hears that kind of introduction, she said, well, of course, he's old. He's been around a long time. So <laughs> it's uh, it good to be with you. Well, one can only hope that in 40 years my my resume looks similar that's something to strive for but you've worked really hard you've got a lot of experience under your belt and i'm excited to hear uh what you have to say about this year's peak season um so to get us started we're going to talk about consumers because they're really going to drive everything we see this peak season um their behaviors their buying patterns what they're comfortable with as far as uh safety and pandemic related um issues so to get get us started in store versus online shopping do you think customers will start returning to stores or are they going to stay online next year well good question emily uh it's in fact it's one that you get almost every day because people want to know when are we going to be back to normal and uh mm -hmm. the answer to that is we're not going back to normal normal is gone and in fact we're not even going to a new normal we're going to a continuum of normals and normals and normals that are not going to uh, slow down at all. I'm going to just take off. I've been doing e-commerce since the late 1990s. And if we look at the, the late 1990s, less than 1% of all retail was done online. It was somewhat of a breakthrough in year 2000, where we hit 1% of all retail was done online. And then it was 2004 before we were able to move that number up to 2%. But since 2004, uh, it's gone up relatively stably. Um, in 2006, it hit 3%. In 2007, it hit 4%. In 2009, it hit 5%. So 5% 5 of all retail was done online in 2009. And that was the first year where the growth was more online than it was in stores and so that kind of shook some paradigms although there was still a lot of people that said you know e-commerce is not going to really make it i mean that that's that's for books that works but not for anything other than books well then so from 2009 to 2019 e-commerce as a percent of total sales went up a percent every single year and so by 2019 it had got up to 15 percent 2017 was kind of a breakthrough year because in 2017, 6,700 retail stores were closed. And that was shocking to people because the number had been around 1,000. And then all of a sudden it jumped up to 6,700. However, in 2018, it went down to 5,500 stores closed and said, well, maybe we just had some stores that weren't doing well. But then in 2019, 9,000 stores closed and then in 2020, 25,000 stores closed. And so what we see is a major shift right around 2020, which surprise, surprise, that's COVID. And in fact, from 2019, 15% of all sales were online, but in 2020, 21% were online. And so there's this huge jump. And so that's really where the question comes from. 
when we go from 15% in 2019 to 21%, how is that going to fall back? And, and the fact of the matter is, I believe it will fall back. I think in 2021, uh, we're not going to have 21% online. It's going to be 17%. But the reason that's numbers playing games with us, because that's a percent of total retail. And in 2020, total retail went down because we all stayed home. No one bought clothes. No one, I mean, what we ate and, and we slept, that's about it. And so if you look at 2019, the total online sales was 598 billion. By year 2021, that's going to be 914 billion. And by year 2022, it's going to go over the bill, the trillion dollar mark. And in 2023, we'll be doing twice as much e-com as we did in 2019. So e-com is just exploding off the charts. And, and stores are somewhat flat and a little bit of a downward trend. I believe in 2024, 20% of all retail will be done online and it'll be a $1.4 trillion business. Now, when you say 20% will be online, that's a big deal, but you still wanna keep in mind 80% is not online, it's in store. So it's not like the stores are going to disappear, but the role of the stores is changing. And so the stores, instead of being where you go to shop, it's where you go to experience things. It's experiential. And so out of our five senses, which are uh, hear, see, touch, smell, and taste, the only one you can do online is here. You can't smell, you can't see, you can't touch, you can't taste uh, online. And so you have to go to the stores for that experiential. Obviously you're buying footwear apparel, unless it's a replacement item, you're gonna to wanna to try it on. You're gonna to to touch the fabric, you wanna look at the color. You wanna say, you know, is this the right uh, thing for me? Does this look well? Um, and so we're gonna to go to in-store for apparel and, uh, and, and, sh and shoes. That, that's shoes, that's gonna be a big deal. Another big deal is gonna be the joy of shopping. Now, this is something you probably know more about than I do, Emily. So when I think of having fun, I think of going to concerts or going to sporting events, but I know, for example, my wife, what she wants to do, she wants to go shopping. So I, I get it, okay? And, and so different folks like different things. But in addition to the joy of shopping, there's going to be the must-haves of shopping. And the must-haves of shopping is today's groceries, it's party stuff, it's you know uh, another bottle of vodka, it's uh, some more uh, chips, it's first aids, it's medicine, it's gasoline, it's doing the honeydew list, the, the, the stuff that does, yeah, gets broke around the house. You got to go get it because you got to fix it now. And so stores are going to be very much a portion of the landscape. And stores are going to be where you go to experience things. But the reality is online is going to be big and bigger and bigger because of the convenience of it. And we all have come through COVID and say, you know, why did I go to the store to buy the Campbell's soup? Why did I go to the store to buy the Cheerios? Why did I go to the store to buy the cake mix? All the boxes, cans, and packages are the same. Do I really care which one I get? The answer is no. And so we are doing all the things that we can online and we're, we're finding it to be much more enjoyable. And that to this subject is driving final mile to all time highs and, and new levels of uh, requirements. For sure. Yeah, I know I started grocery shopping online last year and I won't go back. <laughs> I yeah. won't go back. Yeah. I don't care how high those fees get. Um, so another trend we saw come out of 2020 was this buy online pickup at curb, or I'm sorry, pickup, but B-O-P-I-C, buy online pickup at curb or pickup at counter, or just alternatives to having people walk around a store per se. So we saw a lot of innovation there with people trying to to sell and not have people in close contact with each other. Um, so what are your thoughts on those trends, those alternatives to really a, people going around in store? Will those stay? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, those are uh, all very important. Um, mm -hmm. Buy online, pick up in store is really gonna become the, uh, the, the standard approach to folks who want to go grocery shopping basically the center of the store is boring 
And there's no reason to walk up and down the aisle. The Campbell soup, the box of the, the cake mix and the Cheerios, you, there's no reason to pick them. But the outer ring, the fresh, the meats, the frozen, the wine section, the cheese section, the olive sections, those are, you wanna experience those. You wanna pick those out. And so what we're gonna find is the go-to method for a lot of folks in uh, normal cities, uh, not the mega cities. The mega cities where you don't own a car, it's all gonna be online. But if you own a car, what you're gonna do is you're gonna buy all the center of the store stuff online, mm -hmm. and then you're gonna shop the outer ring. So you're gonna go there, you're gonna shop the outer ring, you're gonna tell, hey, I'm here. And while you're checking out, they'll take um, your buy online and pick up in store and put it out and put it in the trunk. Now, when we have situations where um, there is curbside available, there's going to be some people when they don't need to get in the store. And so now you're not going for your, your meat and your fresh fruit and, and stuff. You're, you're not going for the outer ring, but you're just going to restock. Then curbside is going to become number one. Um, my uh, son and his wife have four kids. And when they were under 10, they had four kids under 10, the last thing she was going to do is get out of the car and go in the store. She wanted to pull into the spot, call them, and have them put it in the back of her SUV. And so, you know, that worked very well. Um, so curbside is hot and going to get hotter. And if you have one store that only has buy online pickup in the store and another one that does buy online pickup in the store and curbside, the one that has both is going to win that game. And so we need to move towards that. One of the things that has not really worked out is the issue of one hour and two hour pickups or deliveries. So the concept of, I gotta have this now, I wanna pay extra and have it delivered in one hour or two hour, that service is gonna be going away because people simply don't want to have that. They, they, if they need it an hour, they're gonna get in the car and go get it and uh, not, not wait for it to come. So I think, um, but buying online, buy online pickup in store, buy online, have delivered from store, uh, curbside, all those options are gonna be important. And the more you have, the, the better off you're gonna do. Sure, absolutely. I, like I said, love some curbside pickup. I have no desire to take my kids there either. <laughs> um, you mentioned the skyrocketing of e-commerce, that it's, it's only going up from here. So how can retailers level expectations with consumers on those delivery times uh, that they might take a little bit longer um, to get to your house. There's no more 24 hour delivery or get them to shop earlier in the year. So we're not in that crunch time after Thanksgiving. Yeah. So the key, the ultimate objective of supply chain is to synchronize supply and demand. And so if, if you can synchronize supply and demand, and every time someone buys one, you buy, you sell one, you buy one, you sell one, and you really make that work, you're gonna be extremely profitable, your overhead costs will go down, and you're gonna do very, very well. So the question is a key one, because the real world isn't going to just synchronize unto itself. And so you're gonna have your supply, and then the issue is, how do we shape our demand so that it meets the supply and in the time frame we want it. And so that's really, really, really critical. And so demand shaping is very easy to do online. Um, mm -hmm. If you're going to have a sale in a store, you're gonna have a buy, buy one, get one free or 10% off or some sort of a sale, but you don't have control of that because you put it in an advertisement that's online and now people come in, they expect to find it. Well, if you do it online, you can have it there now and two minutes from now have it gone. Okay, so you really can manage that demand. Now, there is some work on trying to get the shoppers to shop at different times so that we can have better delivery schedules and so forth. And that's the small thing going on, but you hit the nail on the head with the bigger picture of how do we get people to shop earlier for the peak? Because the peak is, is really, uh, awesome and this year the peak is going to be a disaster and so how do we uh, how do we address that the peak in theory is the last seven days of november and the first three weeks of december so those four weeks is where way too much happens and so what we see is people shaping the demand you, you can't push that demand out 
because no one wants to get presents on December 28th. And so you have to pull it back. And so what we find is that, well, last year, Amazon brought Prime Day in October. Um, they said that was because of COVID. Well, I'm sure that's a part of the truth, but they also did it because they wanted to pull that demand back. But what we saw is the retailers in their stores, they started have Walmart started having a Black Friday sale on September 30th. Well, September, I mean, Black Friday is in, you know, it's after Thanksgiving for crying out loud. That's not. And so what we're finding is that you're finding great deals are occurring in September. And that's when you're going to get your best buying done. Since consumers know that they're going to shop earlier, and that's exactly what we want them to do. So demand shaping, especially online, is very controllable. And you don't have to say 10% off on all sweaters. What you could say is 10% off on the black sweaters, because the white sweaters are selling great. No sense giving them 10% off. Yeah, they'll get full price on those. But it's the black sweaters that aren't selling. So give 10% off on the black sweater. If that doesn't work today, and I still got too many black sweaters, do 20% off. Do 30%, but move the darn black sweaters. We got to get them out of here. And, and so that's uh, the, the world of demand shaping. Now, demand shaping can get very much more sophisticated. And you can buy demand shaping programs that allow you to look at how we should um, adjust these, these, uh, these deals so as to optimize the balance between supply and demand. So it, it's, a, it's turned into a science. It's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, that is really interesting. So before we move on, we're going to talk about capacity. I do want to remind everybody in our audience, you can submit questions. Uh, after we, at the end of the webinar, we will ask Jim questions if we've got time. So make sure you're, you're submitting those throughout. Um, but moving on to capacity, we saw a major capacity shortage in peak 2020. And you've already said demand is just going to increase this year. So but who we really saw the shortage come from were, were those big national carriers, UPS, FedEx, USPS, they told their major customers, hey, you, you can't ship that many packages. We're just not going to pick them up anymore. And then they charged them more money. So did it result in an exodus from those carriers? Did people end up leaving those carriers based on that um, performance? Well, yeah, 2020 was, was bad. And um, it, uh, it, it was really a game changer. Um, no one planned on the growth of e-commerce that we had, and therefore no one had the capacity. So it wasn't as much the uh, shippers leaving the carriers, it was the carriers excluding the shippers. Um, Carol Tomes, who I've known when she was the chief financial officer at UPS, very, very, very good executive, and what she did at, uh, at Home Depot before she went to UPS is she was the chief financial officer. And, and she said, we're not gonna be building, building, building stores. What we're gonna do is use the stores we have and their profits went up considerably and Home Depot has now dominated since that time. Well, when she went to UPS, she looked at what was happening and, and she had the same thing. She had too much demand and uh, not enough supply and so she said, I need to, to kick some people off. And so what I'm going to do is I am going to do what I did at Home Depot. And I'm going to say, these people can no longer ship. I'm going to give them a quota. And when they hit that quota, I'm going to cut them off. We also saw a tremendous amount of surcharges. We saw all sorts of uh, changes in service. Instead of being two-day service, they went to three-day service. And they kept the same KPIs. We saw just, just today. We saw Federal Express for holiday 2021 put in place a surcharge for holiday. When does that surcharge go in, in effect? June 21st. Give me a break. June 21st is not holiday, but they're doing that. And so we saw UPS do what, what Carol says, better, not bigger. What that means is she wants to keep the high margin clients and lose the low margin clients. And Federal Express is doing the same thing. The United States Postal Service, my goodness sakes, um, they've got major, major problems. Um, Louis DeJoy, a good 3PL guy I've known for 30 years, is now the Postmaster General. And he's trying to turn the ship from mail to parcel. 
but he's got this aged infrastructure makes him very, very, very difficult to do. Um, in fact, the post office, they used to have the tagline, we deliver for you. I would say today, with last year's performance, they delivered on time, 65% of the time. I think they should change their slogan. It should be, we deliver for you, maybe. And they used to have the old saying, neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night, and the post office delivers, comma, except for a pandemic. And now they can't perform either. We've seen the hybrid models, the DHLs, the Sure Post, the Smart Post, the Pitney Bowes. We've seen the uh, we've seen all of these folks have major capacity problems. And so where we're going, where we're seeing this thing going to, is where we're seeing it travel to a, a situation where regional carriers are becoming key. And so regional carriers are going to be getting more and more and more uh, of the share of market. And what those regional carriers need to do is they need to be scalable, they need to be flexible, they really need to look at their space, their equipment, and their delivery promise, and then they need to perform. The fact of the matter is COVID-19 was mm -hmm. a stress test for supply chains and for final mile. Holiday 2020, we failed. 2021 is going to be worse. And so this is coming and, and we, we have to prepare for it. In addition, there's changes that are taking place. What used to be B to C is, excuse me, what used to be B to B is turning into B to C. It, it was a business thing, but guess what? You don't pick up your paper and pens and pencils and, and so forth at work anymore. You now have them delivered to the home. What mm -hmm. we're seeing is what used to be truckload is now going less than truckload. What we're seeing is that we're, we're finding a lot of direct-to-consumer from uh, consumer products companies is going around the grocery stores. And so there's these shifts that are taking place that are very significant. 2021, we do not have the capacity to get it done and the nationwide carriers are not doing the job. And so come on regionals, that's where the, that's where the potential is to really make things happen. Absolutely. And I, I think I just heard you answer part of this question about the best alternative to a large national carrier being the regional carriers. Um, so what are some of the benefits of going with regional carriers? Cost, control, what what can a shipper or retailer expect when they move to a regional carrier? Yeah, so um, the, the, the biggest deal here is that the game has changed. In, in in the old days, old days being five years ago, you had two choices. You could either have something delivered quickly and expensive, or you could have it delivered inexpensively and slow. And so what Amazon has done to the consumer, they have spoiled them, and the consumer now wants fast and cheap. And I said, no, 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 you have two choices. You go fast and expensive, or you go slow and cheap. They said, yes, that's right. I want fast and, and cheap. And well, we don't have that. I mean, what are you going to do, make the trucks travel faster? I mean, how, how do you do that? Well, you can't do it by changing the speed of the vehicle. What you have to do is change by the distance the vehicle travels. And so what we now have is urban logistics. What we now have is distributed logistics where instead of having three big distribution fulfillment centers in the country, you now have 12. And so you have a large number of facilities where you have inventory. And so the distance that you're traveling is less far. And if you're traveling less far, why do you need a nationwide carrier? What you need to have is you need to have a good network and then you have to have a regional or local carrier. And so what we're seeing is, is the costs and the quality comes from doing the right job, which is distributed logistics and urban logistics. And so the regional provider is superior to the nationwide provider in doing regional delivery. Now, if you need nationwide delivery, there's no one gonna beat UPS or Federal Express because they got the volume and the infrastructure to do that. But if you're doing local regional delivery, which most people are because the customer wants it fast and inexpensive, um, we're going to find ourselves with regionals really picking up major market share. Absolutely. 
And so as a retailer, what steps can they take to address potential final mile capacity issues for this year? Well, first of all, it's not too early to start now. I mean, we have to start now because there's not, we're not the only one looking for this. I mean, there's a lot of folks looking for it. Secondly, we got to break the paradigm that UPS and Federal Express are the safe decisions. They're not the safe decisions. Their model is not designed to accomplish the job that we have at hand. The third thing we have to do is we have to say, what is the job at hand? I want to know, pessimistic, realistic, and optimistic, three-digit zip, what do you think you're going to ship next year? What, what are the real volumes? I mean, one of the problems I have the, in uh, UPS and Federal Express, what they have is the carrier says, well, we're going to ship 1,000 packages a day, and they show up and they want 4,000 packages. Well, UPS and Federal Express, if they're planning on 1,000, you can't give them 4,000. It doesn't work. And so what we need to do is we need to have a realistic definition of what we're going to do. And I think doing a pessimistic, a realistic, and, a, and an optimistic makes sense. I want it by three-digit. And then what I want to do is I want to go out and shop that. Now, before I shop that, though, what I need to do is make sure that my technology can integrate with the people that I'm shopping it with. A problem I find people is they go out and say, hey, I found a guy that can do this for 15 cents less. And I say, great, that's awesome. How's the integration? Oh, it's going to take them nine months. Well, guess what? It's, it's going to be past holiday before nine months passes. So we got to really look at, can we integrate? Can we make this work for next holiday? Then what we want to do is not tell the regional or the local or the nationwide provider what we want them to do for us. What we want to say to them, here is my total requirements. What can you do best? And tell me what your greatest contribution to this is. And then what I can do is I can cobble together a, na a nationwide solution by doing this and over this and over this and doing this and doing this and handling this and making this and this. And now I have a plan. That takes time. And so what we need to do is we need to get started and, and accept the responsibility for this and not just say, oh, well, the, 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 the carriers can't do what I want. That's not going to get it. Us in the supply chain field, good news, bad news. Good news, we have great visibility. We have become a legitimate profession. Bad news is we got great visibility and the boss is watching us. And so we got to deliver. And so it's time to get started on this. And this has to be done. Um, this is a, a, a definitely a May, June, July type project. Oh, absolutely. It's definitely not too early to start. Um, so you touched on technology a moment ago. Where did technology fall short in 2020? Where, where were those gaps? Well, the one that just blows my mind is the, the automated dispatching and routing. Uh, automatic dispatching and routing has been a proven technology. We all have it on our phone with Uber for crying out loud. Um, why, wh why do we have carriers that still live? I, I, you know, you read on LinkedIn, the guy's job is a dispatcher. Why the heck do you have people dispatching? You know, the computer does that much, much, much better. So automated dispatching and routing is a, is a foundational requirement, and I still see people not have it. Uh, order batching. They say, well, they can handle this job well and this job well. And, yeah, but the driver wants a route. And so we got to batch some orders up and make that done in a way that's optimized for the routing. Um, the third challenge is the, the challenge with real-time visibility. Um, I know there are people that live in apartment buildings and so forth, and they literally want to know to the minute when my package is going to arrive because if the package arrives downstairs in the, the, the corridor, it's possible I won't get it. Someone else will grab it and, and answer it. And so they get a notification, your package is going to be delivered in four minutes. They're putting their uh, slippers on and they're running down to the front door. So they're there to take their package. And if you don't have that real-time visibility, it, it just simply doesn't work. And so those, those are the three that, that, that make me uh, most frustrated because I'm saying, come on, guys, we can do this, but you got to have the technology. Without that technology, you got a problem. Yeah, that technology is available if people just aren't, aren't using yep. it correctly. 
quickly. Um, so as companies are preparing now, because we've already told them you got to start now to prepare, what technology should they have in place for this peak season in 2021? Well, yeah, you should have those first. Now, once you have those, yeah, yeah, good. I agree with that. Um, we then should have the ability to let customers self-schedule. Okay. And so I can tell you that um, you can come anytime tomorrow except nine to 10 and two to three, because nine to 10 and two to three, I got a Zoom call and I can't get up and answer the doorbell. Okay. And so I, I, we let the customers uh, self-schedule. We got to really look at the driver. And so we got to streamline the driver's workflow. We got to streamline the driver communication. We want to streamline the driver payment and the closeout. So we, we got to make technology help the driver in running their independent driving business. And then the last thing is across the board, we need better business analytics. So we can understand how can we improve. And in fact, these analytics, can give us the data that we need to feed back into the demand shaping. And so, but if we don't have those analytics, we don't know what we should do to improve. We don't know if we should make it earlier or later, or when should we offer the sale? And we don't know the implications of that. So we want the analytics to allow us to be able to do those things and to better manage the final mile piece of our business. Absolutely, absolutely. And so 2020, we saw a lot of um, other things outside of Final Mile, like issues with China, um, a lot of global trade issues. And since then, we've just seen uh, more. So how are those global trade issues going to trickle down and affect Final Mile this peak season? Um, it's uh, big. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, uh, you know, the transportation world is made up first mile, middle mile, and last mile. And the last mile is the hardest because the last mile, if you screw it up, it's bad. Or if the middle mile screws it up, it's bad. Or if the first mile screws it up, it's bad. Okay. So it's kind of like being the kid on the, on the playground, the last kid on the whip when the, you go around. It's easy to get hurt. And so what we had is for the geopolitical economic reasons, a lot of companies decided to move out of China. Now, there was this pipe dream that these people were gonna come back to the US, which is kind of a joke, because you can't come back to something that's left. That, that, that building that used to be a factory is now a condominium. The people that used to work in that factory have now have much higher paying jobs. They don't want that factory job or that warehouse job. And so those folks are on and around. So it's not coming back. There's some nearshoring, which makes Mexico a, a very much more popular zone. But the challenge that we're really having is a lot of that China business has been offshore to other Asia Pacific countries. And those other Asia Pacific countries don't have the port infrastructure to allow them to ship. In fact, right now, you cannot get a container out of Vietnam. You, you can't. The, 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 everything is full. You're paying premiums on top of the standard fee and you can't get it out. There's not a, any way to get it out. And so what we see is, this is very aggravating. It keeps telling me to call you, Emily, and it puts oh. this thing right across the screen. So I've called you already, quit telling me. So anyway, I got rid of it again, fourth time. But so what we see is that we're starting 2021 in chaos because the goods that are supposed to be here aren't here. The goods that are supposed to be arriving in early July aren't on a ship. They're still sitting on some deck someplace. And so we really are going to wind up with a major problem in holiday 2020 because people are switching things around without looking at the transportation infrastructure. And therefore we have, I mean, other than um, allocation on a, on, a, on a ship, containers, pallets, drivers and gasoline were in good shape we have no problem oh pallets i forgot pallets we don't have any pallets either but i mean you know it, it's absolutely ridiculous uh what's what we're trying to live through yeah we're out of cardboard too <laughs> yeah cardboard. A, yep i stand corrected you're right we'll get there they're one thing at a time but so global trade um port congestion that's also been an issue this year that's gonna push things down in the final mile as as we keep going yeah. through that? Well, I, I think what we need to do 
is make sure that our supply chain is truly end-to-end -end visibility. The, uh, the word chain is, is an awkward word, uh, although I've used it for many years, uh, I'm not sure I should have, because a chain indicates a link, a link, a link, a link, a link, and it's a bunch of points touching each other, where what I really want is I want this link and this link to know what's going on without having it pass through all these other links. So it's really not a link, it's really a network. So what we need to have is greater visibility of the entire network so we know in advance of what orders we're gonna be able to fill and what we're not gonna be able to fill because we don't have the inventory. The inventory that we have, we gotta sell it early. And so let's do demand shaping and give 10% off on the stuff you got, the stuff that's not coming until October. Don't mark it off because you don't have it yet in a way. And so we really gotta be much more intelligent about how the, how the overall supply network is working than we traditionally have. Yes, for sure. For sure. So uh, we're going to move into some of the pre-submitted questions or the submitted questions from our audience. Um, so starting with, let's see, from Terry, what part of the supply chain is showing the most resiliency, both historically and in these tumultuous times? Wow. The uh, Carolina Hurricanes won a hockey game last night, and the towel they gave us when we went to the game was resilience. So um, if I knew that question, I would have brought my Carolina Hurricane towel up. But <laughs> um, well, it's certainly not transportation. The last mile, the middle mile, the first mile are, 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 the, are the terrible. Um, it's not our suppliers because our suppliers are dealing with the same things we have. Um, it's not supply chain planning. Um, so I guess it would have to be in warehouse distribution and fulfillment execution. They uh, have the most resilience because they have been planned the most upon optionality. And so optionality, different than optimality, optimality, so I'm gonna optimize this. Optionality means I'm gonna provide options. And so if this happens, I'm gonna do this. If this happens, I'm gonna do this. If this happens, I'm gonna do this. And so in fulfillment and distribution, what we're able to do is we're able to adjust to what the requirements are of the day. And so that has given us the greatest resilience. And, um, and so, warehousing and distribution and fulfillment is doing well um, if they have the inventory and they have someone who can deliver the product. Absolutely. Yeah, um, this one comes in from Mike. If I were to create a last mile delivery company today, what are the three main focus areas I should be considering? Three major focus. Number one, in fact, I don't want to be cute, say this is number one, two, and three, but I'll, so I'll give you three, but the, the number one, two, and three is really the driver. The company that has the drivers is going to win the game. And so think about what you can do for the driver. Now, in support of that driver, number two would be technology. You have to have the technology between the shipper and the final mile company and between the final mile company and the driver. You need to have that technology in place. And then I guess the third one is you really get to need to know your customer. You know, it's not an RFP response. It's getting to know what are their requirements, what do they really need to have done and to really help them develop a customized logistics solution because that's, what, that's what's gonna work. So yeah, I'd say drivers, technology, and know your customer. Great, thank you. All right, I believe we have time for just one more question. Um, this one was submitted by Adrian. Is the white glove method of delivery expected to rebound this peak season? Yes. Um, and what we're finding is um, a variety of terms around white glove, uh, over threshold, over threshold, out of box, over threshold, out of box, assembled, and so forth. Um, but absolutely. Um, look at the home gym. Uh, look at the home office, uh, look at the upgrades and television sets, okay? These are all things that require white glove delivery. And so I see uh, a major problem out there is the capacity in white glove uh, delivery. Um, we really need to define our services well. Um, I know uh, my wife and I bought a new bedroom mattress and box springs 
and that's on the second floor of the house and we have a high stairway and uh i certainly didn't want it delivered to the garage i want it delivered to the second floor and by the way i would like you to take the old one away because i don't have anything to do with it well the company doesn't do that but for fifty dollars to the two drivers guess what those two things disappeared and so we need to really understand what is it that we're offering what is the service and then how does it really work and they shouldn't decide what really works based on what the final mile company wants what does the consumer want you know why don't you add 50 bucks to delivery and tell me it includes uh, the haul away because that's uh, you need you need to do that and and so um, I, I've seen some people that say we do assembly, but we won't plug it in. Well, how do you know if it works if you don't plug it in? I mean, <laughs> we need to look at how does White Glove work? So White Glove needs substantially a new set of eyes, and it needs to be done in a way that really is uh, conducive to what the consumer's needs and desires are. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Jim. We really appreciate your time today. You provided some great information. Um, we will be sending out the recording of the webinar for anybody who wants to share it with colleagues or uh, friends. If you have any more questions for Jim, I'm sure you can find him on LinkedIn. Um, his company is Tompkins International, so you can find them online as well. And thank you. I hope you have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Thanks, Emily. Good seeing you.